Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How do we know when irrational exuberance has unduly escalated asset values, which, which then become subject to unexpected and prolonged contractions? That was an excellent question when Alan Greenspan asked it at AEI in 1996, and it is an excellent and highly relevant question for us today. I'm Alex Pollock of the R Street Institute, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our conference, The Bubble Economy Is This Time Different? And thank you all for coming. Uh, Peter Wallison, the distinguished AEI Senior Fellow, is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Peter. Thanks a lot, Alex. Wonderful to see such a great crowd here. This is an important day for all of us. We're going to hear from Alan in a way that we don't often have an opportunity to, uh, to listen. Um, you know, it's really difficult to introduce someone who needs no introduction. But there's so much to Alan Greenspan beyond his resume and his celebrity that I wanted to do more than tell you uh, what you already know. One of my most vivid memories of Alan is when he was a speaker at a meeting of the Council on Foreign Relations many years ago. At that point, he was the Fed chair. I went because I was trying as a lawyer to get a better perspective on macroeconomics. The others there were primarily economists, and their questions were very specific. They sounded to me something like this. What about Johnson's idea in his such and such article that the Collingwood's coefficient nullifies the Ramondi rule? Um, it was a complete puzzle to what they were talking about, but no matter how arcane, Adams, uh, Allen seemed to know every detail and explained where he thought the article might be right or wrong, and on and on it went. There did not seem to be any idea of significance or insignificance in the economic literature that Allen had not read and fully recalled. It was a bit discouraging for someone who only wanted to get a basic uh, grasp of macroeconomics. We first met at the AEI World Forum in early 2000s when I was writing about the dangers of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. He would ask thoughtful questions but never suggested that he agreed or disagreed with my views. I was happy to see, however, that he was becoming increasingly skeptical about the GSEs in his congressional testimony. Then when the financial crisis occurred, he remembered our discussions and invited me to many one-on-one -on -one lunches at his consulting firm. So he could get a better grasp on why, in my view at least, the crisis had happened. In these discussions, I realized that Alan was more exceptional, way more exceptional, even than what he seemed that evening at the Council on Foreign Relations. Many economists I read today seem to be enthralled to mathematical models of the economy and the financial system. Their papers are full of equations suffused with incomprehensible Greek letters and dedicated to regressing an issue to the point of irrelevance. Allen is not that kind of economist. For most of his career, he was a business economist, sat on boards, and absorbed how capital investment, among other decisions, were made. He could probably regress, regress with the best of them, but what he learned went into a picture of the vast U.S. and world economy that, was constantly, that he was constantly building and rebuilding in his head. A kind of creative destruction was going on as new experiences informed and modified old ones. I was certainly not the only person Alan was talking with as he continued to plumb the mysteries of why the financial crisis was so unexpected and so severe. His circle is wide, knowledgeable, and challenging. Many of you may be here today. Perhaps the idea occurred to him that if, the, if markets were entirely rational, there would never be a bubble. Too many rational people would be betting against them. So there must be a major element of irrationality operating here. Finally, in 2013, he committed his ruminations to paper. His book that year, The Map and the Territory, 
was an exploration of the way human nature makes economic forecasting difficult. The book tries to meld the rational world of competition and regulation with the emotional world of irrational exuberance and animal spirits. It's an effort to formulate a, con a better conceptual structure for economic forecasting. This morning, we'll probably hear where this intellectual foray has taken him in the last five years. We should have more economists who think about these truly important issues at that level. One Alan Greenspan is not enough, but at least we have him for one morning. So let's have a warm welcome for my friend who needs no introduction. Alan. First thing I want to do is to move up one logically because I feel as though I'm hanging on the edge of the universe. But uh, thanks very much. It's a very thoughtful uh, analysis. And I would like to just sit here and get more of it. <laughs> but you know, the, the interesting issue is, is this time different? Well, the answer is no. It never is. If you're dealing fundamentally with human nature, uh, one of the most important things that an econometrician can get to see and learn from is that there are certain stabilities in uh, the way economies function because of the way people function, and that is deeply embedded into the human psychology which is invariant through time and shows up with a lot of stabilities in it. For example, the rates of return on uh, investment, uh, equity investment, are fairly stable going back. And I think the most startling statistic is the fact that interest rates in 5th century ancient Greece uh, are not all that different from today which is essentially saying that the issue of time preference on the part of human beings has obviously not altered. Once you can make a statement like that and verify it, in other words, as a statistic which will always be a determiner rather than acting passively, once you can make that statement, there's an awful lot of economics which unfolds. Uh, and uh, what I'll try to do today is to uh, stay away from, as best I can, from uh, all sorts of equations. But I can't fully because, unfortunately, when you begin to look at the complexity of human irrationality, it is very complex and, to a large extent, irrational. So uh, why, don't I, uh, why don't I just first move over? I changed my name. Um, let me start off by saying, in answer to the in answer to the question that's the basic purpose of of, of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I may I may get a state of amnesia, and it's important I know who I am. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the question which is raised for this seminar is basically, is this time different? And the answer is no, and the reason f is that the issues that we're talking about today are as deep-seated in human nature as any of the other aspects of stability that we see through time. Price bubbles reflect a deeply irrational part of human nature. While bubbles have been widespread throughout history, their most fertile source of data uh, to get an idea of what we know about it is actually stock prices. Uh, the 
reasons I think are probably evident to all of you. You know, we know that if investors behaved wholly rationally, we'd expect that the information available to investors yesterday, or T minus one, if you want to do that sort of stuff, would be wholly reflected in yesterday's stock prices and would not spill over uh, into today. Uh, in short, price change yesterday would have no effect on future prices. Daily price change would be a random var variable and therefore would follow a so-called normal distribution. Uh, uh, that's the normal distribution. Uh, well, what we have done is take a compilation of nearly 17,000 daily price changes stripped of their 7.5% annual rate of growth since 1957. The result has really few surprises. In the short term, stock price behavior suggests a significant degree of human inertia with less movement than a wholly random price change would suggest. What I have done is I've taken the actual 17,000 observations, and that is the distribution which spikes up. I superimposed on it normalizing for standard deviation and uh, average. Uh, and uh, what you get is that sort of distribution which suggests that uh, human nature, as reflected in the spiked term, uh, is not a random event. It is not developed in the way we would get most such statistics. And the question is, well, why? Well, the answer is essentially that each observation is related to the next observation. And you can see that, for example, most particularly in the extent to which in the uh, underlying, the, the, the actual 17,000 data, in the middle, it's bulging out. And when you look at in detail what's causing that, it's herding, Herd, the herding instinct of human beings to follow others, follow a leader, and what you'd expect to happen under those conditions is a price pattern which everyone is really contributing to. But it doesn't change in the sense that the fundamentals of herding uh, uh, are deep-seated in human nature. And as a consequence, you will get this sort of different double, in, uh, really a quite different effect, uh, uh, mainly because human, nature's, human nature uh, cannot be changed, has not been changed as much as we try. Uh, in any event, uh, more interesting than either the, I would say, the indications of just inertia on the part of human beings in moving uh, small numbers, which get bigger as we get down into increasing herding and, and the like. But the, the small measures that we're seeing there uh, are uh, invariant and show everywhere, but they're not as interesting and don't tell us as important an issue as what happens when you take the individual annual figures and try to get a moving average of what the variance or standard deviation is. And uh, this is the next. Uh, uh, the next chart. As you can see, there is a very distinct uh, uh, upward uh, 
a, a very distinct um, upward path, uh, which uh, is really showing up most everywhere. It's the, in fact, it's the most interesting part of the data that emerges uh, from its changes through time. Starting in the early 1970s, a five-year average uptrend seems to have emerged after years of sta stable, uh, long-term price change. When I showed my results several years ago uh, to uh, Peter Brown, uh, my good friend, now Chief Executive Officer of Renaissance Technologies Corp., one of the world's most successful hedge funds, applying complex algorithms to rapid short-term trading. He replied to a note I sent him, and I thought his answer was really quite revealing. It tells, it tells us how somebody who is a quant operator, how they think, because uh, uh, as you know, what they basically do is endeavor to let the market issue, the market movements engender investment. And uh, that's, some of the complex algorithms are fascinating, especially since they create trading faster than human beings can respond. Uh, he says, there is no question that the world is speeding up in the sense that more is happening per unit of clock time than in the past. Certainly people are trading faster than in the past, but also the world is becoming more complex and more is taking place per minute than in the past and it's being disseminated through the economic media more rapidly. This would all explain why daily variance, which is a function of clock time, not event time, is increasing. Since more is happening in a day than in the past, the daily variance of prices that reflect changes in the world should be greater than in the past. Uh, this is the type of thing which uh, makes uh, economics interesting. You're, you're always getting new concepts. We're now changing, appropriately so, the nature of time. I mean, the last time it happened, uh, uh, Einstein did it, but I guess Peter Brown now has taken the podium away from him. Uh, I, I conclude from this exercise of taking the data back all the way to 1947 that uh, variance prior to 1972 was stable. Uh, so in a short period back there, 47 to 72, uh, the variance, uh, I think as it shows on the chart, but in recent years, there is a disturbing uptrend has emerged. Stock market trading and prices are gradually being driven uh, from less than fully rational human beings to robots. Such results have mixed implications. Uh, less human nature is being applied to judge stock market behavior, but it is presumably a future with fewer bubbles. Uh, that's the type of conclusion that uh, uh, is very important if it is true. Uh, this is a hypothesis based on relatively few observations, but it's credible if uh, we're thinking about uh, robots taking over the world. Well, this is one area in which they do it. Bubble finance has, in fact, been an integral aspect of economic forecasting, reaching back to the emergence of the business cycle. During the 18th century, 
self-sufficient farms dominated even the most advanced economies. Economic activity was decidedly agrarian and hence climate-driven and regional. With the emergence of the Industrial Revolution in the early 19th century and the creation of banking and credit, America began to prosper, but with it came a new economic phenomenon, the nationwide business cycle. Fluctuations in business activity were increasingly seen to follow a systematic pattern characterized by a gradual but extended buildup of credit and economic activity, followed by a dramatic collapse, so soon engendering a, uh, a crisis or panic. Uh, the terms of, are interesting. If you go back and look just at the normal his history, uh, the term panic uh, is applied to virtually all of the major changes in economic activity, uh, basically from the Civil War forward, but uh, it's, all, it's actually uh, pretty widespread. Uh, Panic is an interesting term because it is a wholly psychological one. And what is happening uh, is that people are, by definition, behaving irrationally. And what, uh, if we took a look at the history from, say, uh, the first, first business cycle identified which is generally accepted to be the uh, period succeeding from 1819, which is, uh, I guess, the first financial crisis followed by a general collapse of the American economy persisting through 1821. Excuse me a second while I put on my reading glasses. It changes my perspective. And, and, uh, and as a consequence, I can't wait to hear what I'm going to have to say now. <laughs> the panic, and this is uh, the uh, 1819 cycle, uh, the panic announced the transition of the nation from its colonial commercial status with Europe towards an independent economy increasingly characterized by financial and industrial imperatives, making it susceptible to boom and bust cycles. In August 1818, with credit dangerously overextended, the Second Bank of the United States branch offices began to inject all, all state reject all state chartered banknotes. Exceptions were made for notes used as revenue payments for the U.S. Treasury. In October 1818, the U.S. Treasury demanded a transfer of $2 million in specie from the Bank of the United States to redeem bonds uh, issued to fund the Louisiana Purchase. State banks in the West and the South, unable to provide the required specie, began to call their loans on the heavily m mortgaged lands that had, financed, uh, that had been financed. Cash poor farmers and speculators found their land values dropping 50% or more. Banks began foreclosing on the properties and transferring them to their creditor 
Second Bank of the United States. When news arrived in January 1819 that the value of cotton had broke, dropping 25% in a single day, the ensuing panic drove the country into recession. Similar crises followed in 1837, 1857, 1873, 1884, 1893, 1896, and 1907. They all had very similar characteristics and indeed essentially represented what you could see in each of these so-called panics. Uh, this is an interesting chart on the operating rates going back to 1855. Uh, we don't have data before then, but uh, what you can see here is a very gradual uh, uptrend, uh, uh, hard, very hard to discern, but what we're seeing is uh, as a first approximation that the economies back then ran off the gold standard, had specie as the base from which their credit expanded, and since specie was essentially limited, uh, we have a very stable uh, environment uh, of, of data. But what the data show is what happens when you put human nature in the same bucket as uh, gold. And what you find is fascinating, is that in every single case, these particular periods have been called a panic. And the essential reason is that they start to develop from, say, the low point and accumulate up in the standard way we've all learned over the years that it feeds on itself, the herding instinct it builds in, and it runs straight up until it accelerates. And then in this context, the context of the gold standard, it would hit a ceiling and crash. And it's fascinating to see through the literature that in every single case they call this thing a panic and you could reproduce effectively the economics of one crisis and put it in another and it explains it. So it's something which uh, is deeply embedded in the data, but as you can well imagine, the politics became increasingly uh, fiercer in that uh, as you know, the agrarian movement, and basically remember that in this period, agriculture is still a very substantial part of uh, uh, the total GDP. And as a consequence of that, you have a situation where individuals are basically looking at the difficulty of getting money for the credits they need, and what's causing the problem? Well. It's the gold standard, or it's anything which restrains uh, credit expansion. And uh, the gold standard did do precisely that. And you have, when you see in the data, there is a gradual upswing in the extent to which you run into crises. And you run into crises basically because uh, specie is no longer available in the fact that it's been committed for other lending and other credits. So that you, you get the pressures coming from the Granger movement and from uh, a whole series of individuals climaxing, uh, I might add, in uh, the extraordinary speech of William, William Jennings Bryan in 1896, uh, Democratic Convention. Uh, the cross, so-called cross of gold speech, which was fascinating in the sense that what he, Brian, was endeavoring to foster was going to the silver standard and or other means by which credit can be expanded. 
But the fascinating part is we get into the last of these types of uh, constraints, the crisis of 1907. Uh, that's the one in which uh, famously J.P. Morgan got a bunch of um, uh, New York City bankers into his library on uh, East 35th Street in New York and uh, locked the door until they agreed to an agreement to essentially bail out or give assistance to the individual members uh, who uh, uh, were putting all sorts of pressures to get help in some form or another. And the question is, what happens in this type of environment if you've got a, an awful lot of momentum going up and it hits a stone wall? Well, the whole thing comes apart, but supposing you don't. Supposing you let the credit run, and that's essentially what happens in the next phase of uh, the, the, the United States the economy in the sense that uh, after huge amounts of political pressures uh, over the years, uh, in essentially uh, uh, anti, anti gold standard, uh, uh, joined with the, remember the Comstock load in silver was discovered about this time. And all of a sudden, you had a number of states uh, who were in favor of silver, so that the pressures in the, in the political pressures were extraordinary, and ultimately they led to the Aldrich Vreeland Act, which is an act passed in uh, 1908 uh, as a consequence of uh, the 1907 experience, uh, you know, what people came away with that, in that, for that year is that the, uh, a single individual essentially held up the United States. I mean, he, not, not hold up in the, <laughs> but he basically, by uh, getting gold uh, borrowed from abroad, was able to put the system back temporarily into place. And it seemed like in a very thin reed to have your economy based on, so that uh, Aldrich Vreeland uh, created uh, a monetary conference or committee uh, examining how, for example, uh, central banks operated in Europe and elsewhere and uh, what types of things could occur uh, to replicate that in the United States. And lo and behold, up comes the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve starts in, the, the bill was signed in December. Uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson signed the bill in, I think it was December the 23rd, uh, 19, uh, oh, well, it spends it basically, uh, yeah, I, I guess you can say the actual signature uh, was uh, 1913, but the implementation did not occur at all until well into 1914. So you have a Federal Reserve in 1914 in endeavoring to counter the problem of the automatic crushing uh, that occurs uh, in, in this, these particular periods, and what you, what I you know what you see there is uh, uh, what happens when you lift the lid, which is essentially what occurred, and we had. Uh, I don't want to get into too many deep weeds, but we essentially had the sovereign credit of the United States substitute for specie. 
I mean, if you look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, that's what you're getting. And uh, as a consequence of that, you have a uh, open-ended issue of the momentum which got stopped in the earlier periods and broke the back of the expansion sooner rather than later, and so that the actual bubble bursting did not have the effect that it started to have uh, during the period of the Fed. Uh, we have two votes here on, uh, for the Federal Reserve. That's not enough. Uh, in any, any event, um, the point I think that we have to become aware of is something happened during this period. 1914 turned out to be obviously a seminal year throughout the world because of World War I and the consequences. But uh, as far as finance is concerned, uh, the, the Federal Reserve would actually didn't technically abandon the gold standard. Uh, it had nothing to do with the act. In fact, uh, it, the act required that uh, uh, Federal Reserve banks, the 12 Federal Reserve banks, uh, hold 40% backing on Federal Reserve notes and 33 and 35% backing in gold uh, on uh, deposits uh, held at the central banks. Uh, well, that didn't work very well because as time went on, every time we got close to the limit, 40%, and then a whole series of lesser numbers, the goalposts were moved back. And uh, if you go and look, it kept changing. The 40% ultimately ended up at 25%. And uh, Lyndon Johnson in 1968, by executive order, uh, abolished all of that. There wasn't a whimper in the market. Nobody cared. But it says, in effect, that the the Federal Reserve Act, which was supposed to be essentially a major improvement uh, and as a first stage, couldn't be made to work because uh, human, human nature political pressures, if I may put it that way, uh, were really overwhelming. Um, Uh, what, what, what's my deadline here? About uh, five or seven more minutes. Uh, let, let me get through. <laughs> I open my mouth and it keeps working. Uh, the, the economic... Uh, climate uh, since 1914 has really been a period, periods uh, moving from uh, sound money, that is gold, dominance to periods of fiat paper money, a supposedly intrinsically worthless currency. The reason I say supposedly is remember that uh, George Washington General George Washington uh, financed the Revolutionary War with uh, so-called Continentals, issuance of the Continental Congress. Uh, you all remember they were not worth a Continental, but they fundamentally financed the Civil War. How? Well, if the discount rate uh, on the Continentals uh, started at zero and then worked its way down slowly so that uh, in a number of years uh, it got essentially down to the point where a continental was not worth the continental. Uh, but uh, remember that uh, 
if you just look at the amount of transactions that take place as the uh, discount rate on the currency goes down, they in fact did create a substantial amount of r purchasing power that fed the, uh, the that fed the continent, the U.S. Revolutionary Continental Troops, and uh, much else. And this issue of uh, uh, so-called fiat currency having no value uh, shows up in all sorts of things. Uh, I might just add parenthetically today, that's what, the bit, that's what Bitcoin is. It is a, intrinsically a worthless currency, but it's accepted uh, because there's an expectation that other people will accept it. And this is what happened with the greenbacks and the Civil War and the like. And the whole period of American monetary history uh, throughout uh, the Civil War period into the uh, Gilded Age uh, are all issues where there's a fight between fiat currency and gold in some form or another and which finally, uh, in uh, 1971, as you know, Nixon closed the, the gold window before we ran out of gold. And uh, gold ceased to be an issue when we had floating uh, US dollars, which hasn't worked all that badly. And it's for the same reason that uh, fiat money generally is, uh, acceptable, and uh, when you put the sovereign credit, meaning whatever that means, but in the United States, it's essentially uh, means that you're required legally to accept currency. It's a redeemable currency. But uh, the, the whole history of finance is this admixture of the irrationality aspect of human nature. And believe me, if you're looking at uh, fiat currency and you can find value in it, uh, something has got to be wrong. Uh, but, you, but as I say, you, you, know, you see it everywhere. And uh, if you have a, I mean, what people started to do after Bitcoin took hold is had their own uh, crypto cryptocurrency and it kept, some of it kept being accepted for exactly the same reason that, that the continental was accepted. And uh, I, don't, I don't want to get too far into Bitcoin, but I think it tells you a great deal about how finance fundamentally works. Uh, in any event, uh, that puts us uh, into the most recent periods. Uh, as you know, we have had uh, really some success in having a uh, basically fiat currency, but uh, essentially not fixed. Remember, it was largely controlled at some point in the past with, you know, when, we, when we got out of the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, uh, and uh, basically, that was, remember that was 1944, uh, we essentially set the dollar on a major new course, which uh, we were the major currency until, uh, which everyone wanted a piece of, uh, and that ended uh, in 1971. But the point here is that the system still works. I mean, we're uh, remember that when you have a floating exchange rate, uh, there is a certain degree of restraint that occurs because if you endeavor to expand it too fast, the exchange rate goes down. And this is the reason why uh, it's sort of a, 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 an interesting half, halfway compromise in finance. but. Fundamentally, it all comes down to human nature, bubbles, 
And uh, I do an answer to the question, uh, is this time different? I would say, yeah, every time is different, but it remains the same. <laughs> well, why don't I open up the questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, when the tour through ideas, uh, history, bubbles, and the bubble of human nature. Um, but we're going to have a brief question time. Um, may I remind you of, uh, uh, of our rules? Wait for the microphone. Uh, to get to you. Uh, when it does, tell us your name uh, and your affiliation and then uh, ask your question. Uh, if, you, if you suddenly find yourself overcome by the urge to give a lecture, uh, instead of asking a question, the chair will uh, remind you uh, to come to your question. So uh, let me see, I think I have a question right here and then we'll come here, uh, then I'll come over to you. Okay, let's, let's start here, please. Thank you very much, Larry Checo, Checo Communications. Uh, Mr. Greenspan, if I may, I, I think what you're talking about when you talk about species is trust. Um, and I would ask you, how much trust should we place in our financial institutions and our American dollar these days? Depends on human nature. <laughs> uh, obviously, there's... Uh, Trust is a <clears throat> critical aspect of finance. Uh, you couldn't have uh, any complex society where there's, uh, people are willing to trust somebody over a protracted period. I mean, we sell 30-year treasury bonds. People are willing to hold it. Well, why? Because they believe that even though getting back uh, fired currency, they will get their currency back. And uh, so that uh, you take trust out of a financial system and it collapses. Because it's all based on interpersonal uh, reactions. And the reason that J.P. Morgan was able to get those people in, in 1907 in that room and beat on them is that he had emerged as the extraordinary person whom everybody, whose word everybody trusted. And uh, he, you know, remember when uh, we were running out of gold, uh, he basically uh, got foreign central bankers to bring gold back into the United States uh, just when we were at the point of defaulting. Now, that is trust. And the question is, well, where did it come from? Well, it came from a long period of, uh, as, as uh, Morgan would say, uh, uh, he never looked at anybody's balance sheet. He just uh, I, didn't, I don't believe this, but he said, <laughs> he did say, he looks at a person and can tell whether he was trustworthy. Uh, but the point here is that, uh, you, you know, the, the, if you had a whole listing of what human nature, sort of the, the forces of human nature, uh, trust is one, bubbles are another, these are all invariant and uh, repeat time and time again. I guess we could say when everybody trusts everybody, that's part of the herding, which takes us to the bubble. Uh, that lasts only until... Until <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I had a second question right here, please. Wait, wait, for the, wait for the microphone, please. Uh, in your view, is the historical precedent? Excuse me, and you tell us who you are. Julie please, Geneva, you? EGBN. Uh, is the historical precedent for where the markets are today, and are the markets are vulnerable now for sudden withdrawal of the liquidity by dark pools, and why after significant correction the overvalued stocks keeps going up now again? Well, I'm, uh, I, 
I'm not quite sure what the question is. I think the question of where, where are we now, uh, if we look at this historical pattern, can't, are we now in, in the grips uh, of a new hurting overvaluation well, uh, no, bubble well, or not? I'm saying we're always and partly in that grip. I mean, it's just a matter of degree. Uh, if you're asking me, uh, 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 are equities overvalued? Well, I think you have to ask yourself, uh, basically, I mean, what we do is we take, uh, instead of looking at price earnings ratios, we look at earnings price ratios, and we can just c construct that as the sum of real long term interest rates, inflation expectations, and by far the largest and volatile part is, is uh, equity premiums. And uh, right now, uh, equity premiums uh, are, I guess, somewhere in the range of normality. The real issue is real long-term interest rates are exceptionally low. Indeed, if you look at the history of the United States, uh, before they took this very short-term move recently, they have never been lower. I mean, going back to 1789. Now, if, as I indicated before, uh, interest rates are stable, as, uh, as a human characteristic, there's only one direction in which that can go. And what I think you're going to say is, I, I'll argue that there's both a stock bu bubble and a interest rate bubble, or bond market bubble, I should say, and at the time. And the bond market bubble is essentially the determining force uh, because uh, to reach equilibrium, it's got to move, whereas all other aspects have a lot of fluctuation. It is at its low interest rate. Real interest rates are at their lowest levels of extremity. And by definition, if you're at your lowest level, there's only one direction you can go. But if that goes up, then it changed, it, it tends to alter the earnings price ratio and would bring stock prices down. And that's what's happening. Uh, I'm not going to go out here and be a stock market forecaster. But I know what the forces are, and it's a question here of uh, trying to d determine which is the driving force. Remember that the, the, the stock market uh, is being driven to a large extent by the one thing that I think the, tr the Trump administration did right, got the 35 percent corporate Tax, marginal corporate tax rate and mm -hmm. brought it down to 21%. Uh, I think that probably caused the result of everyone watching Ireland. Ireland did exactly the same thing in 1998. And uh, it had been a pretty dull economy before then. And immediately thereafter, for, for, for you know, five years or more, its a productivity increase was more than 5% per year. Now, it's an extraordinary change, and I think that what is happening here in the United States is we're underestimating the impact of that. Because remember, uh, uh, going back to my pre-Fed period when I used to be on a lot of boards, uh, uh, I would sit there and watch them go through the you know, evaluation of a particular project to get board approval. And at the very end of the cycle was, this is our pre-tax forecast, this is our after-tax forecast. And all you have to do is move the tax rate several percentage points and a whole a whole uh, cascade of projects will fall on the let's do it type uh, r relationship. And I think that's what's, ha what's happening at the moment. The only difficulty is 
that the stock market cannot go up irrespective of the cash flow and everything else like that if real long-term interest rates are, are, are rising. So it's a trade-off here between which of the bubbles is going to be determined. And I have the capacity not to have to answer that question. <laughs> I, I think on that point, unfortunately, we are out of time. But thank you very much. Now, uh, uh, would you all please stay in your seats for just a minute so that we can give Dr. Greenspan a, uh, a chance to have a clear exit here, and then we're going to call the uh, panel up uh, in just one minute. Standing panel to follow Dr. Greenspan's remarks and to continue uh, this discussion of uh, human nature uh, uh, bubbles and, uh, and their unfortunate aftermath. Well, how do we know when asset prices are in the grips of irrational exuberance and have become inflated to bubble status? And if we knew, uh, what should we do about it? And where are we now? And how culpable, or perhaps praiseworthy, are the Fed and the other major central banks for inflating asset prices? And what are going to be the lessons of this cycle? Let me introduce the panelists who will give us the answers, of course pointing out that the answers are not required to be mutually consistent among the, uh, among the panel. Uh, First, we'll hear from Bill White, who is the chairman of the Economic and Development Review Committee of the OECD in Paris. He's an expert on monetary and financial stability, as well as the processes of international cooperation in these areas. Bill was head of the Monetary and Economic Department of the Bank for International Settlements and spent 22 years with the Bank of Canada, rising to deputy governor in 1988. He began his professional career with the Bank of England in 1969. Uh, which, as we were saying, was the same year I started in banking as a trainee, so he and I have lived through all the same financial crises together. Uh, next will be Vince Reinhardt, the chief economist and investment strategist for Standish Mellon, where he is responsible for developing views on the global economy and making relative value recommendations. Previously, Vince was chief U.S. economist at Morgan Stanley and a resident scholar at AEI, where he and I often discussed financial cycles, bubbles, crashes, and their aftermath, but we didn't stop them from happening. Now, Vince was with the Federal Reserve for 24 years, most recently as director of the Division of Monetary Affairs 
and Secretary and Economist of the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, next will be Adam Posen, the President of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, Adam has written extensively about the financial and economic challenges of the European Union, Japan's economic crisis, and monetary and fiscal policies of the G7 countries. He was an external voting member of the Bank of England's Rate Setting Monetary Policy Committee, where he advocated an activist policy response to the most recent financial crisis, and serves as an advisor to the U.S. Congressional Budget Office. Uh, our last speaker will be Desmond Lockman, a resident fellow at AEI where he focuses on the global macro econ uh, economy uh, and is known to many of us and perhaps many of you for his constantly sunny, optimistic outlook. <laughs> uh, this includes his recent comment in a letter to the Financial Times that the new Federal Reserve Chairman Powell has, quote, the unenviable task of having to diffuse a global financial market bubble, unquote. Desmond writes extensively on international economics, financial crises, debt bubbles, currencies, strains in the euro area, and such daunting financial problems as Greece, Italy, and Puerto Rico. And as you know, he is the organizer of this conference. Thank you, Desmond, for getting us all together for this timely discussion. Uh, each panelist is going to speak uh, for from 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, after that, we'll give them a brief chance to react to each other or clarify, uh, clarify points. Then we will open the floor to your questions, and we'll adjourn promptly at 12.30. Bill, many thanks for being with us. Are we getting you the clicker for your slides? Is it, oh. is it on the podium? Hang, hang, on, hang on a moment. We, uh, ladies and gentlemen of AEI, we need the clicker for the slides. I have no slides. I'm psyched. <laughs> Hang, hang on, just just a minute. We've got it. We've got it coming here. Okay, thank you, Bill. Thanks again for being here, and you have the floor and you have the clicker. Uh, can we? I hope this is not going to count as part of my. <laughs> time. Okay. There, we, there we go. The bubble economy is this time different. Um, let, let me thank Desmond in particular for the invitation to come here. I have many happy memories from the 1980s when I used to come down and, uh, and, uh, and visit this place. And uh, <clears throat> in those days, I was a young man, and I particularly enjoyed talking to an older man who was Herb Stein. And Herb, of course, was the guy who invented the phrase, if it's unsustainable, it'll stop. And that, I guess, is going to be a bit of a, a sub-theme. So from the sound of it, uh, we, we may start off with a little pessimism, finish with some pessimism, and hopefully get some more optimism in the middle. Um, I've only got four slides, um, one for the past, uh, well, two for the past, uh, one for the present, one for the future. And the reason why I've got more slides about the past is that um, I remember it better than the other bits. <laughs> um, I'm not going to take as, as uh, what is the word, a, a, a broad and historical scope as, as Chairman Greenspan, but I do want to talk about the last, the last 30 years. You know, the, the line, I've only got a minute, so let's talk about the world. So in four slides, let me, let me, let me get on with it. Um, how, how did we get into this mess uh, leading up to the crisis of 2007? Um, I, I want to suggest that, um, as Chairman Greenspan said, we've had uh, sort of irrationality and bubbles and panics and, you know, from time immemorial. Uh, I'm also very aware that uh, Vince here has actually written a lot of stuff about it. And there's now huge literature about all of these historical episodes. Um, I think this most recent one, uh, it began with good news. They all begin with good news. And basically, in a fiat money system, it's very easy for rational exuberance to morph into ir irrational exuberance. And it, and, and it happens all the time. And I want to suggest that in the last 30 years, the real driving force behind what we've seen, the good news was the demographics. So we had a combination of the baby boomers coming through, uh, China, Slovakia, all these command and control economies coming back, massive increase in, in, in supply, if you want to put it that way. Now, the natural sort of thing that goes along with a big supply side shock like that is very rapid real growth and a very strong tendency for disinflationary pressures. 
So you get a big increase in supply, the demand doesn't keep up, and what you see essentially is what you get. Well, monetary policy, um, I guess what I would contend, is didn't really um, lean against the credit expansion that was going on driven by this good news. None of the sort of public policies resisted this upswing in the kind of way that they should have done. And uh, you, you can see it actually, we, we had cycles, for example, there was some reference to it earlier on. We had a, we had a, a, a big setback, a credit-driven property thing set back in 1990. Uh, we had another one in 1996 in Southeast Asia, 1998, 2000, and finally, of course, 2007. And in each one of those cases, what you saw was that monetary and fiscal policies never leaned against the upturn as much as they leaned against the downturn. And so the upshot is cycle after cycle after cycle, we had a ratcheting down of interest rates and a ratcheting up of debt. And so the problems that we faced as of 2007 were, in a sense, uh, cumulative because of the sort of same policies being followed year after year. And while this was mostly a phenomenon in the advanced market economies, it spread to the, to, to the emerging market economies as well. And the, the basic rationale was pretty simple, which was from the perspective of the emerging market economies, if you guys in the industrial countries can print the money without limit and the credit without limit in order to get your currencies to go down, which is what was going on in the lead up to 2007, we, China, and everybody else can print the money without limit to prevent our currencies from going up. And that's basically what happened. And so in the end, it was, as I saw it, an accident waiting to happen. Uh, that certainly was the message we were trying to get across at the BIS. But um, it's very difficult to get people to see a bubble when they're inside a bubble. Um, what's happened since? Well, when you think back to about 2008, 2009, Every policy you can think of to lean against the downturn of 2008 and 2009 was, was brought out of the closet, okay? So we had very, very easy monetary policy. We had discretionary fiscal expansion, regulatory forbearance, cars for clunkers, short time working, you remember all of those things. But very quickly what happened was that the governments realized that the long-term effects of all of these things were not desirable. And gradually, all of the stuff was reversed. And the most important one, I think, was the early reversal of fiscal stimulus, because the Germans managed to convince everybody that Greece was everybody's future, and we all had to pull back. Personally, I think it was a big mistake. We can talk about it later. But in the event, all of these other policies turned around and became tighter. And regulatory policies in particular were part of it. So that Instead of the regulators focusing on have we cleaned up the last crisis, they went almost immediately into crisis prevention mode to prevent the next crisis. That too, I think, was, was a big mistake. But what it did was it left monetary policy as the only game in town. And of course, as you're all well aware, we've done an enormous number of very inventive things with monetary policy since 2008. I won't run through them all. But the bottom line is that they're essentially more of the same. Because those policies are all premised on the idea that aggregate demand will be stimulated by these easy monetary policies. And secondly, you can forget about the unintended consequences because they're not big enough to worry about. The, the fundamental premise. And the first point that I want to make here, the second last bullet, is that um, it has in fact failed to raise these easy monetary policies. They failed to raise aggregate demand in the way that people anticipated. So we've had, it's been almost 10 years, okay? And many countries are still not back up to the pre-crisis level of, of output. We had nine years in a row where the IMF, the OECD, the Fed, and virtually everybody else was forecasting it's gonna get a lot better next year, and then it never did, so they had to revise the forecast back down again. It hasn't worked as intended. And I would point out, as Keynes himself predicted, we, we often hear people say that these policies are actually Keynesian policies because they stimulate demand. They're not. It's Keynes of, the, Keynes of the treatise in 1931 advocated the policies that people are following today. By 1936, when he wrote the general theory, 
wonderful line in chapter 12 or 13, I think. If we are tempted to assert that money is the, is the drink that stimulates the system, we had best remember there are many slips twixt the cup and the lip. And then he goes on to prove why it won't work. Well, so much for assumption one, it will work. Assumption two, no, 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 no side effects, no imbalances. I'm going to suggest here that the imbalances are huge. Uh, they're diverse. It's not just the asset prices. It's not equity. It's a whole range of things. First one I want to point out is that global debt ratios are now 40 percentage points of GDP, bigger than they were in 2007. So if you think this crisis has been a period of deleveraging, think again. It's been the very opposite. And one of the problems is that whereas previously this problem of debt was a, a problem of the advanced market economies, now it is truly global. Okay? China, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and one of the big problems is corporate debt. There's been a huge expansion in corporate bond issues by people who are non-resident of the United States. There's something like $10 trillion worth out there now without taking into account derivatives and all that other stuff, just overt exposure, $10 trillion in, 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 in currencies issued by, in dollars by non-residents of the United States. Asset prices at unsustainable levels. Uh, we've talked a lot in the last week or so about uh, equity, Chairman Greenspan talking about the bond bubble. Uh, we know that Covlite loans now are at record highs. Uh, the VIX has been at record lows up until just last week. Uh, there are just enormous number of places. My own country, Canada, debt ratios, uh, household debt ratios, household prices at levels never seen before. Same thing in all the Nordics. Any country that managed to keep the banking system going has, has pumped out mortgages since 2007. We've got some real issues there. I think the risks of financial instability have risen as a result of easy money. Uh, the first point, of course, is that the margins have been squeezed for the insurance companies, the pension funds. Everybody's in trouble. Even the banks are now complaining about it belatedly. Um, they've been taking on all sorts of risks that they wouldn't otherwise have taken on before. That trend to instability, I think, has been compounded by structural developments. The insurance companies and pension funds had the demographic problem to deal with. The banks have got the problem of high tech to deal with. And on top of that comes this threat, really, from ultra easy monetary policy. And I think you can even go so far as to suggest that it, it may have contributed to the slowdown in productivity growth. So we think, we, we think what we've been doing is increasing aggregate demand, and of course it hasn't worked. You can make a very good case that at the same time, it's actually been doing something on the supply side that's not very healthy. So we think about these zombie companies. There was a big uh, meeting I was just at in Paris a week or two ago. There's zombies that are everywhere, companies that the banks are afraid to put out of their misery, so they stay there and compete against the guys in garages who would otherwise be able to get a loan from a bank even though they had no collateral. So there are all sorts of things out there that I think are unfortunate about what we've done. Well, where to from here? And this is my last slide. I said right at the beginning that I thought the basis of the good news that kept the rates low, that kept uh, the boom going, was the demographics, the baby boom going through, the arrival of China. It's all going into reverse. It's all going into reverse. We know that. The baby boomers are out of here. The labor force is already falling in China and Japan. So this is all going to go into reverse. And I think what that means is that the inflationary pressures will be stronger. Uh, and that really ought to mean that monetary policy moves into tightening mode. And I would add here about the rising imbalances that all of those things on the last slide that I didn't like, <laughs> one reason why you ought to tighten monetary policy is to stop them from getting worse. But the difficulty is this, and it's the second bullet. It's what my colleagues at the BIS refer to as the debt trap, which is the debt levels are so high you have to tighten policy to stop it from getting worse, but if you do tighten policy, you may actually trigger the problems that you're trying to avoid. And so everybody's sort of temporizing, and you can see it in the way the Fed's been behaving over the course of the last year or a couple of years, where they're not sort of moving ahead in the way that I guess we, we might have thought that, 
recent shocks like the tax change would have implied that they should do. So we're in a, we're in a place where we don't want to be. And I would just note, by my judgment, every region in the world has got serious economic and political problems. So that everywhere you look is subject to some kind of a, a possible shock. And I guess my point would be that in the kind of world in which we live, where you've got all of these interrelationships, the trade, the value-added chains, the financial, everybody's got the same Bloomberg and Reuters, okay? <laughs> a shock anywhere is a shock everywhere. So I think the whole thing is, 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 is um, we're in a difficult situation, one that I think it is possible to imagine we could get through, but frankly, I think the odds are stacked against it. Well, what are we gonna do? My second last bullet. Hoping, I'm hoping, this time is different, <laughs> but preparing for the worst. And what I mean by that is that if you think there are problems, not even necessarily or likely, but possibly coming down the road, prudent policymakers should be preparing for that time. And my contention would be that we are well short of having done the stuff that we need to do. Uh, I think, for example, about memoranda of understanding between the various actors in a crisis. Are they adequate? I don't think so. Deposit insurance. The Europeans in particular have still got a big problem in terms of euro deposit insurance. Lender of last resort. Uh, I know Hal Scott was speaking here just a few months ago. Talked about the way in which Dodd-Frank basically is going to tie the hands of the Fed. I talked earlier on about the $10 trillion worth of dollar-denominated liabilities that are out there. When the crunch comes, there's a lot of people going to be short of dollars. Who's going to give it to them? The Fed? Maybe. Is Congress going to let them? Maybe. There's a lot of uncertainty. It's a million miles from an international monetary system. Okay? It's a kind of international nun system, and I find it all very worrisome. What should we do when the next crisis hits? I'll be honest with you, I don't know. I finish with this, I can tell you what will happen. What will happen is what happened in 2008, which is that the monetary spigots will go on, the fiscal deficit will blow out, there will be regulatory forbearance, et cetera, et cetera, because that's what has to be done. And it will happen again. The only thing that I do hope is that one recognizes next time that relying and continuing to rely on policies that are unsustainable okay, is not appropriate because as someone from this institution once famously said, if something is unsustainable, it will stop. Thank you, Bill. I'm tempted to call a five minute break so everybody can call their brokers. <laughs> but <laughs> instead we're going to... Uh, to go on to Vince. And more optimism, I hope. Uh, even, even more. Uh, the opportunity to be a relative optimist is, is quite striking. Uh, and I, too, have a presentation. Uh, which, uh, first of all, I think we should commend Des for scheduling something so far in advance the week after there was about a $4 <laughs> trillion dollar change in U.S. map market capitalization in about 24 hours. That's pretty striking. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I would admit, however, I would, come, would have come anyway since it is in my latest post-nuptial agreement to intervene for any non-sanctioned use of the phrase, this time is different. Uh, shame, shame on you. I also like to thank you for putting me in the familiar position of explaining what Alan Greenspan just said. Uh, that's easy because I think when it comes to asset prices and monetary policy, I, I know no, of no one who's been more influential in my own thinking. And I too, like Alex, will start, Alex will start with the Ur text, the most famous rhetorical question of the second half of the 20th century. But my focus isn't on the famous two words in that. It's rather the framing. Because what Gr Chairman Greenspan did was summarize the hard part of asset pricing and monetary policy. How do we know when asset prices are wrong? And work building from that, I'm going to take a four-part trip. First, going to talk about the presumption required for an understand to make the assertion that asset prices are wrong. I will uh, indulge a little uh, 
pedantic uh, exercise because Finance offers a very useful distinction between mispricings and asset bubbles. And knowing that distinction is helpful in talking about policy, which will be my third uh, uh, topic. And then lastly, before you get too impatient, I will talk about pricing or the most evident mispricing in global economy right now. So first, the presumption. Basic message is that pricing long-lived assets is complicated and it's difficult to be confident about the appropriate level. This starts from the generic asset pricing uh, formulation that Chairman Greenspan talked about. The price of any long-lived asset is its income stream discounted by some rate of discount and that income stream could come from dividends, coupons, rents, royalties. And the discount rate is the sum of the risk-free rate, a risk premium, less any expected capital gains because you could get some returns from the cap capital appreciation. In turn, the risk premium is an amalgam of attitude and perception of risk. Pretty straightforward, but it also lends itself to confident extremes because there are so many different moving parts. You might assert, for instance, that all those components are pretty well approximated by historical averages, in which case you're on the left here asserting markets are just almost never right. You're only at fair value in passing. But you can also look at that same formulation with all those moving parts and say they can justify anything. Markets are never wrong if they can move around to explain valuation. So that $4 trillion change in market capitalization was a revision towards attitudes toward risk in about 23 hours. Um, I think policymakers actually sit in the uncomfortable middle in which assets are mostly viewed as approximately valued at fundamental, fu fundamentals unless there is considerable evidence of outsized expectations of income or capital gains, an unusually and temporarily low risk-free rate, or unacceptable, ex uh, uh, unsustainable acceptance of risk. Also note in this formulation, when some assets are overvalued, other assets are relatively undervalued. Like I personally think our conversation about house prices would be much better informed in the U.S. if rather than asking why do households devote so many resources to, to, to homes, by asking why don't they own more businesses? Why don't they have more resources in retirement accounts? Sometimes looking on the other side of the coin is helpful. Now my little excursion, uh, and this is more than anything about the title of this session, finance makes a useful distinction. And that is all asset price bubbles are overvaluations. But not all overvaluations are asset price bubbles. An overvaluation occurs when net demand is unsustainable. Prices are high, but not in a way that will be sustained. Prices can be wrong, but they can be wrong for a long time, and they may be wrong uh, wrong longer than your investors have patience. A bubble occurs when expectations of outsized capital gains feed a rising valuation. People expect capital gains, that increases their demand for an asset, that increases the price of that asset, that creates even more expectations of capital gains and it feeds on itself. That is, prices can be increasingly wrong. I think that's a useful distinction because an overvaluation does not require ever rising prices. They could persist. And a variety of policies could be in play, including the central bank setting of the short term rate and suppression of volatility, the government's encouragement or discouragement of specific assets. Again, housing is a good example. We say in the US that, that the American dream is to own your own home. I think that's wrong. The American dream is to get rich quick. If the government channels household finance to favor housing, don't be surprised that there's a lot of resources devoted to housing. And sometimes in that narrow channel, it overflows or is too low. 
And then lastly, it could be something about foreign ap appetite uh, for your own domestic assets. On the right side, a bubble, as Chairman Greenspan said, is intrinsically wrapped up in human nature. Deflating a bubble requires defying the general public sentiment. Indeed, you have to testify before Congress and say, people who have thus far been proven right are getting too rich. Uh, once popped also, a, a, a bubble like a balloon is hard to reinflate, which is probably why crises are so costly. Now, I like to think of an asset price bubble as a runaway trolley, and that's going to be helpful for two reasons as we turn to a discussion of asset prices and monetary policy. Admit it, let's face it, it, it it's an inconvenient reality, but asset prices have always been an important part of setting of monetary policy. But the bubble component can be especially hard to deal with. That is, the expected mean and variance of asset prices matter for the setting of monetary policy. At the Fed, we used to talk about, in the 90s and the early 2000s, the asset price syllogism. Uh, you can see the hand, uh, fingerprints of Alan Greenspan on this. Because of the lags and the effects of monetary policy, actions must be based on the economic outlook to achieve the mandated goals. The prices of some important assets matter for that outlook, and therefore asset prices influence the setting of monetary policy. Now, there's a, a, a Stein supplement for the, to the syllogism associated with Governor Jeremy Stein, which basically takes account of variance. Policymakers must take account of the risks to the achievement of their goals. A, a significant asset price correction may be a tail risk derailing the achievement of their goals at a considerable cost. Therefore, policymakers should react to significant mispricings that raise the probability of a crisis. <clears throat> Means and variances of asset prices do matter. Now, we're going to take a ride on the trolley. I admit a very anachronistic uh, phrase. First, we have a case study of someone who stretched out on the tracks to try to stop the trolley. <laughs> and that was Alan Greenspan 20 years ago, approximately. He defied public opinion by, in that er quote, talking about irrational exuberance. I would point out, at, at, as at the right, subsequent to that speech, the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed below the level just before the speech, a total of eight trading days for the remainder of his term in office. <laughs> that is 0.3% of the experience of the remainder of the Greenspan Fed. Um, there's another reason to talk about trolleys, and that's the theory. Because the trolley problem has an interesting background in ethics. And it's also a favorite of undergraduate coffee houses. So imagine a trolley is careening out of control and that you are at the switch. You have your choice. You can leave the switch untouched, and that may lead to the probable death of 12 people in the trolley. You could throw the switch, send the trolley on a different track, and that may probably almost certainly lead to the death of two people. Which is better? Passively accept the possibility of harm to some or actively cause harm to others. And the, and the fact is there's no right answer in that the decision depends on the value weights and your understanding of the potential victims the subject, subjective interpretation of phrases like probable and almost certain, your willingness to take blame based on your action. And all this is assessed in real time with limited information. Oh, maybe I was talking about monetary policy. Because a mispricing could lead to a policy action or not. Letting the mispricing persist may raise the pro passively raise the probability of financial crisis, but do you want to be actively in front of that and, and therefore allow your economy potentially to have below trend growth? But perhaps Jeremy Stein would say stably below trend growth. 
There's no right answer, and that's why asset prices and monetary policy are a recurrent conversation among central banks. But as for the current conjuncture, I'd assert that detecting bubbles may be hard, but an accelerant to their formation is in place right now. Uh, first, okay, sometimes bubbles are easier to spot than others. I will admit, like Chairman Greenspan, that in the left panel, the relative price of Bitcoin per U.S. dollar doesn't seem moored. You can't have such a stratospheric rise uh, linked to plausible outcomes. But others are really hard to spot. Uh, on the right panel is the range of... Uh, House price appreciation across 20 cities in the United States. And when it's uh, on the order of 50%, one might be tempted to say that's bubblish. When it can swing in the range of almost 100%, one may question the, uh, uh, the, the wisdom of markets. But these double-digit changes also seem to be about demand pushing against more or less inelastic supply, i.e. the high gains are in places where it's hard to build and property is limited. Is that a bubble or not? That's a judgment call. There is, I think, one more, much more evident current misallocation, and that's the lowness of policy rates across advanced economies. The left panel uh, gives the range of experience across the OECD with the euro area still having a negative policy rate and the U.S. inching forward uh, but still well below its, its, its experience. But even more striking is the right panel, which looks at the, uh, the universe of advanced economy sovereign debt yields as of Friday. And as of Friday, there was about more than seven trillion dollars of sovereign debt at a yield that was negative. There is more debt trading below minus 50 basis points than there is above four percentage points. Um, this isn't just about the policy rate and sovereign um, uh, securities because that pricing equation applies to all long-lived assets, and so the effects of low rates are everywhere. And here I just want to remind you that the asset pricing formula that Chairman Greenspan uh, talked about actually defines a rectangular hyperbola as in the right, i.e., when discount rates are very low, prices are very high. When discount rates are very high, prices are very low. That's why every Wall Street Journal article includes that, that helpful sentence, when price bonds, prices of bonds go up, interest rates go down. Uh, but what the other feature of this hyperbola, when the discount rate is very low, we are pushed against the left axis. And it isn't just that the price of long-lived securities are high, they're very nonlinear, even small changes in the discount rate. So what that says is when the riskless rate is low, when volatility is suppressed, the prices of long-lived assets are inflated. And small changes in any element of the discount rate, the riskless rate, the risk premium or expected capital gains, produce large changes in rates. So central bank action matters. And if I were to sum up, I'd just remind everyone pricing long-lived assets is complicated and it's difficult to be confident. And we need compelling evidence before, this, before saying they are under or overvalued. But it does seem to me that monetary policy remains an accelerant to overvaluations, bubble formation, and volatility. And in the pursuit of the dual mandate, the Fed should take account of asset prices, and, and especially so in weighing the risks surrounding the achievement of these goals. Uh, if that subliminal message was, was uh, too obtuse, unsustainable, unsustainable, take account of asset prices and weigh the risks surrounding those prices. Thank you. Thank you. And Ed. I turn back the balance of my time. Which is negative. <laughs> Good comments. Thank you. Adam. <laughs> uh, thank you. I actually was live tweeting a bit of Vince, and now I'm going to set my timer. Um, 
So uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, Desmond was kind enough to invite me back. We, he and Alex and I participated in a session on Brexit in this room six months ago that went very well, even if Brexit hasn't. And similarly, I expect this session to continue to go very well, even if the bubbles do not. Um, I guess I am the one notch more relative optimist um, because I do think there are ways of coping with the situation we now see and I do worry less about the immediate situation in terms of damage to the economy than some of my colleagues here. This is not because I have a cosmically different view than Bill or Chairman Greenspan or anybody else. I, I make no pretense of knowledge about um, the rationality of people. Uh, one of the things I live tweeted was I like Vince's comment, the American dream is to get rich quick. Um, it, clearly the Bitcoin chart should, rash, should rattle anybody's faith in, in the ability of markets to always get it right. So it's not about that. What I do want to do, picking up on some of the big questions that Alex said for us, is to talk a little bit about monetary policy versus, sorry, regulation. Um, in dealing with asset prices and bubbles. And I have a slightly different view, I know, than Bill. And um, I think if you buy my view, you'll be a little bit more optimistic. Uh, and I'm hoping you'll buy it for its logic, but at least buy it for its optimism. Um, the, the basic point is we do know a little more, not from so much the rationality of individuals, but from the impact of various asset price bubbles and their collapses then has been summarized. I mean, again, people on this panel have contributed to this literature, so I'm not lecturing them, but it hasn't really been set out. And so a few things which have to be mentioned. First, in the spirit of Vince's last slide, there is the issue of when do you go after asset price bubbles if you are a central bank. And it's not just a matter of the trolley problem or your willingness to take blame or even your ability to identify bubbles. It is the fact that we, going up until and through the last crisis, you would have, depending on the country, anywhere from three to eight very large asset price appreciations for every crash. Um, and by crash, I don't mean just correction. I mean a crash being something that the asset prices come down and they have a material effect on economic growth. And so as you're calculating how to deal with this, one of your calculations has to be not just how bad is it going to be or how out of whack is this pricing, but how many false positives you're going to kill off before you actually uh, make it worthwhile. And this goes back to something we were talking about, the Ur text of, of Greenspan's remarks. Another uh, key text was the 98 uh, Jackson Hole paper by Ben Bernanke and Mark Gertler that Alan Greenspan, I believe, praised at the time, which argued that it wasn't worth it for central banks to pop bubbles. And that argument loses some force when you see just how bad is the aftermath of a really bad bubble but it doesn't get totally overturned. So the first point is not every time you see an asset price boom does it have the same effect. The second point is that this extends even more so to debt. Um, Bill and his former colleagues work at the BIS, Vince and his uh, co-author Carmen Reinhardt and others um, have done a lot of work on this, but the fact remains there isn't a, a, a simple one-to-one -one mapping between the level of debt you have in a country at any given time and the amount of pain you're going to have later. And I, get, I know you're not claiming that, but I just, want, I just want to point this out. And in fact, quality of debt matters. And there are a lot of nuances to it, but I think the two big lessons we would take, or at least I would take from the literature, is first, real estate debt and real estate overvaluation is much more damaging and worse than almost any other form of debt. And there are a variety of reasons for this, but it's just empirically obvious. So even before this most recent crisis, Eugene White, Rick Michigan, and other distinguished economists have documented that the worst downturns in US economic history were generally those involving real estate crashes. And if they didn't have real estate crashes, the effects were not that big. And if you look cross-sectionally at what happened in Europe in this last crisis, those that had the real estate problems, Ireland, Greece, Spain, 
did much worse than the other countries that, like Italy that had debt but didn't have the real estate problems. The second thing we know, which is, this is one place where I will express a little surprise at my colleagues. We haven't heard the word leverage once, I think, or, or if we did, I missed it. Um, leverage matters. So it's not just asset prices. It matters how much the system is levered up. And this is something that, thankfully, in part due to Vince and many of his former colleagues at the Fed, and Nellie Lang, who's now down the street at Brookings and others, we actually do have data, and more importantly, we actually pay attention to it now. Um, the, the unfortunately getting cut back Office of Financial Research at the US Treasury have been doing good work on this. But anyway, central bankers are at a minimum paying much more attention to leverage. And this is worthwhile because, and this is the same argument why, for example, we haven't designated uh, asset managers, the same kind of systemically risky institutions as banks, because they're not levered. You sell an asset, there's a counterparty and immediately liquid. So there's a fundamental logic there. And then the third point I would make, third broad point I would make in my remaining, I think, four minutes, anyway. Um, of course, my phone shut off. Um, 3.37. Four minutes is right. Thank you. Um, is that you have to think very hard, and again, Vince has written about this elsewhere, but it didn't come up in his remarks. You have to think very hard about what tool you're going to use if you decide you're going to pop a bubble. If you decided you've identified one, if you decided it's worth it, if you decide there's enough leverage in the system, if you decide it's worth it, you go down the list and say, okay, it's worth it, even though we admit there's going to be costs. You got to decide which tool. And an argument that's been running for a long time, which goes back to the Bernanke Gertler paper of 20 years ago, on which I've been out there on quite a bit, is the idea that there are tools other than the main interest instrument interest rate of monetary policy you want to use. And to me, the way to think about it is, I'll take a famous quote that I think is 100% wrong. So the very distinguished Jeremy Stein, who's back at Harvard but served on the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, gave a quote once saying, the great thing about monetary policy is it gets in all the cracks. That is precisely wrong. <laughs> the whole point of the financial crisis was that Markets fragment, you can't price things. There are individual institutional, regulatory, and other incentives in each market. There is no easy substitutability. If monetary policy got in all the cracks, we would not have had the same problem. And well, certainly we would have recovered much faster. And so the emphasis has been on this ugly name, but we haven't come up with anything better, of so-called macroprudential policy. And it's not great, and we're still learning. But there is evidence, including among my former colleagues at the Bank of England recently, that you can do some real leaning against the wind through macroprudential policy than as opposed to just tightening rates. So why does this make me more optimistic? Because then if we look at the current situation, I think central bankers, including the ones we now are having come to leadership at the Fed, do recognize that they have to be ready to take asset prices into account, as Vince said. They are focusing not just on asset prices per se. Nobody's going to tighten interest rates just because of Bitcoin. They're focusing on the right issues, or at least approximately, a closer approximation of the right issues and distinctions than they used to. And then you look around right now, and as was happened to be pointed out in Vince's two-piece two chart, if you look at the real estate prices in the US, the real estate situation is not as bad by any means as it was 10, 15 years ago in terms of overvaluation. I'm not saying go buy in Nevada right now. I'm just generally. Um, and the leverage is much less. And this is the place where I differ a bit in interpretation with Bill. I think his description about the regulators got it maybe ahead of themselves trying to prevent the next crisis rather than cleaning up the previous crisis. I think there's a lot of merit to that. But one of the good things they did is they really clamped down on leverage. And even to the degree they didn't formally clamp down, we know historically after financial crisis, and we're seeing it now, because people are trying to cover their butts, and especially with supervisors and with owners of banks, they put out less leverage after a financial crisis. So I am much less worried right now. <laughs> but I do want to go back to something I think Bill referenced, and I, you were referring, I think, to, to Scott talking about this, and I've written about this, and others have, that we have constrained the Federal Reserve. Its emergency powers are different than they were. That came in part of Dodd-Frank. 
the macroprudential framework in the U.S. It goes through this interagency committee called the Financial Stability Oversight Committee or Oversight Council. I can never remember FSOC. Um, and as all of you who've worked in Washington know, interagency committee is another word for death. Um, <laughs> you, you, know, you have no direction, you have no power, you have no ability to act quickly. And so to me, the short-term policy issue to get ahead of the curve for the next problem is to try to learn from others' macroprudential policy and improve the process of the U.S., but I am admittedly less worried than I think some of my colleagues here that we're going to face that problem imminently. Thanks, Adam, and thanks very much for bringing up the central role of real estate in, uh, in financial crises. Uh, and it goes with leverage because real estate somehow yes. tends to attract more leverage than, uh, than many other things, exactly. at least, exactly. and they do go together. Uh, our final speaker is Desmond Lachman. Yep. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm not sure that I was happy with the description of always being optimistic. I rather <laughs> pessimistic. I rather see myself as a, a purveyor of realism. Uh, you know, just give a reality check periodically. Uh, what I want to say uh, is one thing I meant to say, which you know might uh, answer where I come out on the issue. Is is this time different? Uh, you know, my answer is yes. This time is different. Uh, it's a lot worse than 2008. Uh, Sunny. Now, the points that I want to make, uh, you know, are basically two points, you know, maybe echoing Bill to an extent, but giving some uh, slides that will substantiate the point. Uh, the first point I want to make is that we've got all the ingredients for a 2008-style crisis. Uh, the second point relates to the timing, to the triggers. There can be many triggers for this, but I'm bold to say that the triggers are coming into place rather quickly in the sense that we're going to be getting a tightening of monetary policy, and as soon as interest rates go up, that is when the liquidity comes down, and that's when all of these asset price bubbles uh, burst. So that's what I want to uh, develop uh, in the remaining time I've got. Uh, before that, though, I just want to say, make quite clearly the statement that at the heart of this, I'm not assigning blame, are the central banks around the world. And we've just gone through the most extraordinary period of central bank history where the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, and the Federal Reserve have managed to expand their balance sheets over the past seven, eight years by something like $10 trillion, taking out of the market all of the risk-free assets, pushing everybody into risk, and that is really the underlying reason why we're in the situation we're in today. So let me go through the uh, ingredients of the, bubble, uh, the, the ingredients of why I think we've got a crisis coming on a rather big scale. The first is uh, Bill has referred to the fact that debt levels today are very much higher than they were on the eve of 2008. The second point I'd make is that bubbles or credit mispricing or asset mispricing, if you don't want to use a pejorative term like bubbles, but the mispricing of assets is very much more pervasive than it was on the eve of 2008. Then the bubbles were largely the United States housing market, the United States credit market. What I'll develop right now is that these bubbles really transcend all markets. This is really a global phenomenon, and it's not really surprising because we've had so much liquidity in central banks around the globe. Uh, and the third reason for my pessimism this time round is that the room for policy maneuver is less than before, uh, that uh, monetary policy is constrained by the zero bound, uh, there'd be resistance to quantum easing, uh, and the Trump administration in their wisdom have decided to use up the room for fiscal policy response during the good times rather than to save it uh, for the bad times. So uh, let me go on to develop each of those points on the uh, 
the uh, debt, take that first ingredient, debt. The world is really drowning in debt. If you've got any <coughs> doubts, you know, just look at this chart. You know, come, come from a place like the International Monetary Fund, where you see the debt levels increasing at a very much faster rate than the black line there, which is the rate of nominal GDP growth. So what it means is the debt to GDP ratios now, as Bill has mentioned, are something like 30, 40 percent of GDP higher than they were on the eve of the crisis. What bothers me is that the debt has increased in a lot of economies uh, that are very important uh, and that can have a very big bearing on the uh, economy. So, you know, for instance, like if you look at this chart, courtesy of the IMF, uh, we see that China has had a credit bubble, the likes of which we haven't seen before. The rapidity with which Chinese credit is growing, this is problematic. This means that at some point the second largest economy uh, of the world is bound to go onto a very much slower path, very much like uh, Japan did, uh, which would be uh, problematic. Then there's the minor point of Italy, uh, a country not known for its ability to grow its way out of growth, not known for its political stability, not known for its strength of its banking system, but known for having debt to GDP continually rise. So we had a very much higher rate in Italy, and I just mentioned in parenthesis uh, that the Italian bond market just happens to be the third largest bond market in the world after the United States and Japan. So we've got a situation uh, there that is bothersome. Bill mentioned the issue of emerging market corporate debt. Emerging market corporate debt, they've been issuing debt at the rate of around a trillion dollars a year. You know, just a small number. The debt has kind of gone up from something like 10 trillion to 25 trillion. Around about $3 trillion of that is dollar-denominated debt, you know, which is problematic considering that we've got a Mexican election coming up in June, uh, which looks like it's going to go the wrong way. A populist on the left is going to come in. I don't know what that means for United States, uh, uh, Mexican relations, or what it means for investor confidence, but it's not too good that they've got a lot of corporate debt. And of course, there's Brazil, uh, which is moving in a totally dysfunctional way. You know, politics, uh, that uh, is problematic. Let me go on to the question of the bubbles, that the bubbles are so much more pervasive than before. Uh, so the first chart I'd put up uh, is just, these are 100-year charts uh, that of uh, the equity valuations in the United States. We've only been here three times before. You know, this looks a little bit before the 29 crash, you know, which shouldn't give one comfort. So you've got bubbles in the equity markets. But that's the least of my worries. My worries is more in the bubbles or the mispricing that we've got in the credit markets. Uh, we've spoken about uh, government bond yields being at the lowest uh, level uh, historically. Uh, that uh, Vince mentioned, you've got still around about $10 trillion of uh, government bonds selling uh, at negative interest rates. Uh, but the real problem for me is the risk products that spread levels have gone to so low a level, this is really an accident waiting to happen. So whether you look at the United States high yield market, uh, you know, we're at lows, you look at emerging market corporate, despite all of the debt, the interest rates are at ridiculously low levels. Collateralized uh, loan obligations, you know, we thought that they had learned something in 2008 experience. That's back in fashion. Uh, housing price bubbles, uh, let's just look at Australia, let's look at Canada, let's look at China, let's look at the United Kingdom. Those are in bubble territories. So the point I'm trying to make is that we've got bubbles. It's not just the stock market bubble, it's credit market bubbles all over the globe, and that means that you're going to get financial distress when this thing unwinds. Uh, I can't resist just pointing out at a minor level, you know, just if you're doubting my uh, discomfort about how irrational lending has become, you might just want to reflect on the fact that Italy, the country with all of these problems, and Portugal, they borrow at a lower rate than the United States government, you know, kind of like what people in the bond markets are thinking beats me, uh, that 
you've got countries like uh, countries like Mongolia, Iraq, Tajikistan, most bond market bond traders I'm sure can't place most of these countries on the map, yet they lend them money, they oversubscribe their, <laughs> uh, their deals. Argentina just placed a 100-year bond. A minor detail is Argentina has defaulted five times in the last 100 years. It didn't stop them from placing a 100-year bond. So there's a little bit of mispricing all over in uh, the markets uh, that should worry. Let me go on to the triggers uh, that the uh, triggers you know, it could be anything, you know, it could be, I'm not saying that it's going to be the interest rate, but, but the interest rate story makes me think that that is, these bubbles are not long for bursting. You know, I would say I realize that economists should make predictions but shouldn't give time frames, uh, but I, in this case, I'd say that I'd be bold enough to say that this is within a year or two's business, you know, because the monetary cycle has totally changed. And the reason I say that with a fair degree of confidence is what's going on in the United States is that the United States economy is in risk of overheating. The Federal Reserve has done very little to do it. It's way behind the curve. So the reason I say that is that monetary conditions uh, have never been so easy. And what monetary condition, this is a chart, it doesn't have a good heading. Uh, but it's a chart from, many people put these financial conditions together. What it is, is it's to look at how much impulse the economy is getting from the combination of interest rates, uh, a cheap dollar, big increases in equity prices. So what we've seen is we've seen massive increases in equity prices the last year. The Fed does nothing to offset that. So monetary policy is very stimulative at a time that full employment is very close that we're already seeing inflationary pressures. And if you, that's not enough of an argument, uh, the administration manages to do an unfunded tax cut and a uh, spending increase that's going to add another point of GDP of stimulus in each of the next couple of years. So as you get this overheating, you're going to get interest rates rising. I would just say in conclusion that those who take comfort from the fact that you might have a compliant Fed not raising interest rates and that's going to keep this party going are forgetting about something called the bond vigilantes. When they see that inflation is getting out of control, they'll be dumping the bonds, they'll be driving up the interest rates, the interest rates will increase in a, uh, in a less orderly way than if the Fed were in front of the curve, uh, and I think that that's the more likely scenario. But my expectation is that we're not far from uh, seeing this whole house of cards uh, unravel. And I think that the question that Bill raised is the right question, is that it's not too early for us to be thinking, how do we get out of this ever repeating cycle of bubbles with fiat money? You know, we go from 2008 we're now going to go to another one, in my view, the next year or two. How do we get out? How do we respond to this in a way that doesn't set us up for the next cycle uh, in 10 years' time? Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Desmond, and thanks to all the panel for very stimulating and provocative comments. Uh, I'd like to give the panelists each a couple of minutes, uh, three minutes absolutely maximum, just to uh, make any comments you want on what somebody else said or uh, uh, draw further points uh, of, of your own. So, Bill, you want to start? Well, just you're, you're good. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, how can I say? I, 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 agree, with, I agree with them all, um, <laughs> particularly, of course, with, with Desmond. But the, the points and, 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 and Vince, but I, I, I guess the, the point that I want to make about, uh, that Adam made about the regulatory side I think actually is a very important point, and there's a, there's a long literature on this stuff now. Um, there's a piece by, I think, Jorda Schulerich and somebody else, Hong Kong Monetary Institute, with a very, very long database, pointing out that if you're looking, if you're looking for the villain, <laughs> it's, it's property, it's, and it's housing. And this goes back, not to say it's always in, always involved, but, but it is involved. And so that gives you some sort of belief that perhaps uh, 
you might be able to use regulatory policies in a thoughtful way to try to deal with the housing thing as such or the commercial property thing as such. So much of the emphasis today has been on monetary policy, but it's a much broader set of issues and a much broader set of instruments. Having said that, I just want to make one last point and, and about the use of macro prudential. I, it was actually the BIS, I mean, before I even arrived, that macro prudential was invented okay, by Alexander Lamfalusi, uh, the subsequent father of the euro. But um, the basic idea, which is an idea I think that the BIS still holds to, is that when you have a situation where you observe sort of broad bubble-like characteristics, not just in one area, but going back to, to Desmond's point where you've got broader implications of excessive credit expansion, but housing is a big chunk of it, that the recommended policy response would be some combination of tighter money, because I think it, 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 it does help deal with some of this over-leveraging and, and whatever, some combination of that plus macro potential, so that the two would be moving essentially in the same direction. But at the moment, what we've got is something that's totally different, and I don't think has been adequately researched. The, the whole point is that we want to use macro prudential today, or at least many people say that, in order to allow monetary policy to continue to be lower for longer. So this is a situation in which these two big instruments are working at cross purposes, as opposed to supporting each other in a complementary way. And that's, that's, a big, that's a big difference. So I think when we talk about macro prudential, there's certainly some use for it but it's got to be done in a way that uh, doesn't uh, overtly conflict with the conduct of monetary policy. Thank you. Vince? Uh, just three points. And, and, and the first is I reside in the uncomfortable middle. We really should have a pretty high hurdle to say <laughs> assets are grossly mispriced. And uh, when, when, when we are in that other, other range, it is appropriate to... to that it influences the setting of monetary policy, but uh, it is not the day-to-day -day business of uh, central bankers to be opining on as asset values. I think that um, my wife Carmen and I did a paper um, uh, for Jackson Hole a few years back and looked at the 15 worst financial crises of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, ten years after a severe financial crisis, the level of GDP per capita is 15 percent below what the trend of the ten years prior to the crisis would have predicted. Uh, part of it is about human nature. We recoil from risk taking and it takes a while to, to uh, convince people to come back. Part of it is the regulatory pendulum swings. We, uh, we over tighten. Uh, in, to make sure that this, whatever this is, even if we haven't defined what this is, uh, never happens again. And uh, I think that regulatory over, over tightening is, is, is material right now. And then the, the third point is uh, if you tell me that sovereign debt loads are very high, that central bankers are worried about debt loads across households and, and firms, and they just so happen to be very reluctant to raise interest rates, I would say that that's not an accident, that that, in fact, is a mechanism to erode the real value of that debt over time, in which case um, the, the next ev uh, event may not be about the financial crisis. It may be about the inflation upturn. Thanks. Adam. Um, I guess the, the, the only thing I would add is that um, the inflation upturn and the bond vigilantes and, and all that, I would just be a little cautious. And again, I know you're not saying otherwise. I just, I just want to, I want you should, I would urge people to be a little cautious about that for three reasons. First is, Today's CPI print, print does not make an, an inflation spiral, okay? We, we ignored four to six months of declining CPI numbers in the second half of 2017, rightly, and you may not want, and the Fed may not want to overreact to a couple months of high data in this six months. Second, um, as was implicit or 
pretty explicit, actually, in, in some of my colleagues' remarks. You know, let's not just keep referring to costs in the abstract, as, as, as Vince clearly put forward with the body on the tracks in the, uh, in the trolley problem. If we cut off a recovery when you're pulling people back into work that has material long-lasting effects for possibly millions of people. So, you know, we, we, we should not get too pre preemptive here. I mean, unless we're very confident. And the third thing, just to go back to what I said earlier, is even if the bond vigilantes kick in, as, as Desmond says, I would not count on that popping the bubble. You could have a steepening of the yield curve done by market forces that affects U.S. Treasury rates, but that does not necessarily, and again, I know you weren't saying that, but that does not necessarily uniformly take care of everything. That's sort of the point we came back to and why Bill mentioned the back rubber. Thanks, Desmond. Yeah. I guess I'd like to make two points. You know, one is I can understand, you know, the Fed's reluctance uh, to pop bubbles, you know, they don't know whether the bubbles exist and so on and so forth. What I can't understand is how the Fed in 2017 seemed to be totally oblivious to the fact that asset prices were increasing at that rapid rate. And the reason they should have been paying attention is if stock prices increase by 25% as they did last year, that means wealth in the United States increased by something like $6 trillion. People spend part of that wealth. That is equivalent to several interest rate cuts. The Federal Reserve, despite asset prices going up, and I'm not including house prices, other prices going up, injecting all of this wealth, the dollar depreciates by 10%. The Fed stays on the same path that it stays before. So what the Fed's done is it's put us into a situation where not only did they allow the asset price bubbles to continue to inflate during the year, but they've put the economy at risk of overheating. That that gives the drive, you know, that's the reason that we, in my view, that's the reason why the economy is growing as rapidly as it, is, as it is. That's the reason why you're beginning to see signs of inflation. The Fed is way behind the curve you know, put us into a difficult situation. The second point I'd like to take issue with is the, the trolley analogy. You know, I think that it's very nice to say, well, uh, maybe you're going to kill 12 people this way, maybe you're going to kill two people that way, what do we do? I don't think that that is a fair analogy because I think that the analogy should be there's a very high probability that we're creating a bubble. When that bubble bursts, Millions of people are going to get thrown out of work. Not only are millions of people going to get thrown out of work, but after 2008, we're going to be putting the economy on a low growth path. This is the weakest recovery we've had for the last uh, umpteen years, growing at 2% a year after that bigger recession. So the costs of allowing the bubble are so high, the probability is so great that what are we doing, you know, for the sake of one miserable percentage point of GDP, we prepare to risk the whole economy. And that is, I think, the fundamental mistake this, at the Fed. This is the point I have to fundamentally disagree with my friend Desmond. The, there was a missing step there that he asserted. He said the prob when you think that there's this bubble, the probability is so high that you will have all these people out of work. That is empirically incorrect. If you take the Reinhard Rogoff data set, if you take the IMF's data set of financial crises, of asset price bubbles, you go through them, most of the time they do not result in large downturns. So you, you can do this argument you're doing, Desmond, but you can't assert that it's a high probability because you see a bubble, many people will be out of work. Uh, well, I just say, Let's have this conversation in a year or two. But before we do that, uh, let's look at what happened in 2008. You know, that this has got all the signs of 2008. Uh, you know, I think that the Fed has been derelict in its responsibility not to take into account, you know, because if you just had a bubble or two, that what you've got bubbles right around the globe, you've got mispricing of credit markets that is huge. I think that what they're doing is they're 
taking comfort in the fact that they might have a better handle on the banks, but what they're forgetting is that 70% of the credit is intermediated through the shadow banks, and they're forgetting what happened in 1998 uh, with the LTCM crisis when they caught off sides. This is where the real stress is going to be. It's going to be in the side of the lightly regulated hedge fund, that kind of community, where we've also got problems of too big to fail, and the interlinkages are so large, they'll take the financial system with it. Which illustrates, Bill, uh, which illustrates my precise point, that in 98, LTCM blew up, and so a lot of hedge funds lost money, and nothing happened to the real economy. I've got a short comment from Bill. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, I mean, I respect what Adam said about the, 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 the sort of the average outturn. You can have a bust, and it doesn't necessarily have big effects on the economy. It depends on which financial asset you're looking at. But I think when you look at the developments over time, it does seem clear that the incidence of these, these bubbles that have real side effects is getting greater, and the magnitude of the effects seems to be getting greater as well. Um, I would just add that it's not just, it's not just the economics. Eh? So I, I hear people, and Vince and I and others have had this out, you know, if, if you run the economy, let's say, super hot for 30 years, you get more gains in GDP than you lose when you get the inevitable, down, you know, big downturn. The problem is it's not just the economics. It's the, it's the social and the political aspects of it. And again, now, there's a, a literature. I, uh, the one piece that comes to my mind is uh, Fuente, Schulrich, and uh, Trevish is the name. Yeah, three, three German guys that have used this sort of database of Schulerich and Taylor, you know, that long historical database, and they look at the political aftermath. And what you see traditionally is what we see today, is that you get a polarization after one of these big financial crises between the socialists on the one hand, it's not left and right, it's the socialists on the one hand and it's the nationalists on the other hand, and you put the two of them together as in 1913, you get the national socialists. And so we shouldn't just think about this as uh, doing a kind of economic calculus. There's a political calculus. And then we're back into Vince's world where you have to realize that that's even more, un it's even more uncertain than the economic side, but the costs can be significantly greater. On that yeah, note, yeah, we could, we could. Oh, okay, Vin, you're the only one who hasn't had another turn, okay. so. I was just pointing out. Bill, Bill White was the discussant of the Jackson Hole paper, and one thing we, we, we had done but didn't put in the paper is the probability of regime change in the five years after a severe financial crisis in that sample was about twice. Yeah. yeah this yeah. is a, 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 a very good and provocative uh, point. Before we come to your questions, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to do remind, well, I, I want to remind us all of uh, Vince's uh, curve of the graph of how small when you start from a very low base, what, how small the changes in real long-term interest rates can be to get big changes in asset prices, which I think is central to these discussions. Now, we are going to get to your questions, and thank you for, for being here with us. And I, she was waiting before. We're, we're going to come to you because you were trying to get in before. Uh, um, and then, let's see, we're, uh, we'll, I'll come this way here. Uh, a reminder, wait for the microphone, tell us your name, tell us your affiliation, and uh, proceed promptly to your question. And now it's your turn. Thank you for the fascinating panel. So there is a competing Tell view. us your name and association, please. Grace School, Jocena Capital Management. Uh, there is a competing view uh, in the monetary policy circle that technology has solved inflation. And the predominant worry we have these days is inflation being too low, not that inflation would run too hard. And it seems like Milton Friedman's theory is kind of dead, given how much technology is changing the world. Uh, do you agree with this theory? And you know, uh, how do you think about technology and productivity uh, in today's economic uh, policy setting? OK, who want to take a crack at that? Bill? I think there's, I mean, I've, I've painted a fairly dismal story here, largely to do with debt to GE ratios globally going up. Well. It may well be that there will be productivity increases of such a magnitude that it will overcome those kinds of tendencies and we'll get big GDP increases and debt to GE will gradually go down. The, the only problem with the productivity story is it's going to have to be a big change because the demographics are working in the wrong direction in terms of nominal GDP growth. 
And we've actually seen very little evidence to date of the productivity increases that a lot of people think might be coming down the road. Here, there are people who are far more expert than I am of totally different views about what the future is going to bring. I, I tend to be more optimistic. Uh, I sort of tend to think that we're at the verge of technologies interacting in a way like the I, iPhone, you know, nothing really new in it, but it's a combination that really makes a difference. But guys like Bob Gordon say it's not, it's not going to happen. So again, we go back to sort of doing your kind of calculus. And uh, I, w I would be, I, I think it would be imprudent to count on technology helping us out. Could I just add one thing, though, and that is that it may well be that for various reasons, you know, the change in the character of what it is that's being produced, that that's what's actually driving a good part of the price decreases. And as I said right at the beginning of my comments, if you get price decreases that are a byproduct somehow of supply-side shocks, this is not a bad thing. And I didn't really mention it in my presentation, but I do think one of the mistakes that all of the central banks have made is that they, their analytical models don't adequately take into account the fact that you've got supply side, supp positive supply-side shocks. And if the prices want to go down, they ought to be allowed to go down. The, the, there's a big literature now on the issue of d do inflations accumulate? And the answer, apparently, from the work that I've seen, is that the Great Depression in the United States was virtually the only time you can point at sort of much slower real growth associated with declining prices. So that incident was unique, and to use it as a basis for the general policy that central banks follow in the face of price decline strikes me as totally misguided. Can I, Anybody can, else on yeah. inflation? Adam? Yeah, uh, uh, specifically, Adam and then Vince. specifically on this point. I think I, I completely agree that this, any sort of mechanistic monetarism related to money supply or anything has been conclusively debunked. It was actually debunked in the academic literature before the last 10 years, but if you don't, didn't believe it now, you have to. More contentiously, what I think, and this is by no means proven, but I am increasingly of the view that uh, rather than inflation being everywhere, a monetary phenomenon is very much a question of a real phenomenon about bargaining power and pricing power um, competition in labor and product markets, which relates to what you're saying about the changes in the world. Um, and we're getting more and more evidence that's what determines a lot of inflation, uh, both long-term averages but also fluctuations. Mm -hmm. And so where that leads to, just to say, is this is where Bill and I flip. I'm the, I'm the pessimist. Um, I have grudgingly come to the conclusion that Bob Gordon and other uh, productivity pessimists are right. Um, it may be that productivity will jump up. Um, my colleague Olivier Blanchard always reminds me that at a 10-year horizon, U.S. productivity growth is basically a random walk, so it's possible it could jump up. But when you've seen the productivity slow down, go across the rich world simultaneously, a lot of OECD work on this, um, and be persistent, you begin to worry. And so I do think that's going to be a constraint on everything, and that is what I'm much more worried about than inflation. We have a couple volumes on this coming out from Peterson Institute, if you're interested. Uh, Didn't you just, have a comment? And then we're going to come to a Sure. Just question. first in terms of productivity, yes, it's across industries in the U.S., across advanced economies, even EEM. It's, it's, it occurs even as you control for resource, uh, factor utilization. Uh, but the fact is economists really aren't particularly good at forecasting this. We told the world <laughs> that productivity growth slowed in 1973 and about 1980, and that was a, a part of the uh, Federal Reserve's policy mistakes. For regard to inflation as a domestic macro person, the rest of the world's bigger, and we have to take that into account, and that is a force. Uh, tending to restrain the in increase in inflation. And when I talk about inflation picking up, I'm talking about inflation ticking higher in an environment in which we probably uh, have uh, not much slack left. But Janet Yellen was basically right. And then the other two things, concentration has got to be extremely important. It is a, a, a battle for margins that is going on out there. And then lastly, if we are talking about a bigger rest of the world, we also should talk about mismeasurement, of which obviously we do a lot. Okay, let me come to the next question here, right here. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I'm, I'm Paul London. I, I was here at AEI a few years ago, or maybe 10 years ago now, and had a very 
interesting time here. So um, I've had a bug in my bonnet for the last year about Henry Simons, who I think is most of the people on the panel know was a founder of the Chicago School. And uh, Chairman Greenspan really touched on it when he pointed out that there were times during the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, uh, when people tried to answer the question, uh, when Henry Simons raised the question, why does the government, and I'm talking now about government, why does the government borrow money when it could print it? And uh, a lot of what Henry Simons, uh, Milton Friedman called Henry Simons a revolutionary and uh, said basically that Keynes was a reformer, a mere reformer, I should say. <laughs> and this panel has talked almost entirely about Federal Reserve and uh, sort of monetary policy in, the, in this context. And I wonder whether there's any chance of getting beyond this almost total dependence on the Fed to something better. All right. Getting beyond the, on the Fed to something better. Sure. Comments? Desmond. Yeah, I think uh, that <coughs> the problem that we're in, the reason that we've got back into a situation where there are a lot of bubbles, where there's too much debt, I think it goes back to the way in which we responded to the 2008-2009 crisis in that, for reasons that were stated before, different governments were not prepared to go in with the right kind of fiscal stimulus. So what turned out is all of the burden of dealing with getting a recovery going was put on the central bank. You know, and that is really what occurred. If we want to improve on this next time around, I'm a big fan of helicopter money in the sense that what we're really wanting to have is instead of having the central banks go out and buy all of these assets in the financial market, distort all financial prices, set us up for the next crisis, what you do is you have a check being delivered to every United States citizen financed on incredibly generous terms by the central banks of the world, you know, let them uh, do it that way, you'll get the recovery without distorting the financial part. I think that there's a way uh, that we can avoid it, but I've been around too long to know that that's not going to fly. Next time around, we'll repeat exactly the same mistakes we did before, and we'll be on the cycle not only of having booms and busts, but each boom and bust is going to be of a bigger dimension. Bill? Yeah, it, it's, um, it, I attended a conference last week in Zurich, uh, Rushlikon, just outside of Zurich, and it was on the Sovereign Money Initiative. And they've got 111,000 Swiss people who signed a petition for a referendum. And there will be a referendum in, on narrow money in Switzerland. And it turns out that there's 10 or 12 groups around the world, actually, who are interested in the issues. Positive Money in the UK is another one, the Cobden Center. And going back again to all of these ideas about uh, narrow money and uh, Irving Fisher and, and, and all of these guys, my, my sense of it is that um, any change in a monetary regime uh, is going to be extremely, the, effect, the effects of it are going to be extremely uncertain. And uh, Chairman Greenspan made a reference to uh, uh, William Jennings Bryant in 19, uh, 1896. And uh, there's a famous article by Schumpeter, which is called Depression, uh, 1934. And uh, he refers to uh, this uh, election campaign. And of course, William Jennings Bryan was running on the, on the basis of bimetallism, which of course would have been on the face of it much more expansionary than just a monetary system based on gold. And Schumpeter makes the point, he said, well, you would have thought that everybody then would have sort of <clears throat> rushed for real goods whose prices would subsequently go up, but they didn't. The whole system collapsed. And that's the kind of observation, when you start playing around with monetary regimes, not policy, you better be very careful about how you do it. And my advice to this outfit in Zurich was there's a lot of things that we could do better to, to 
what's the word, to mitigate the damage done by these cycles, these credit cycles and booms and busts, there's a lot of other things that we could do better, and we should try to do them better before we get to the last, the last refuge of the scoundrel, which is let's just change the system entirely. <laughs> Having said that, um, I, I do actually think that something went wrong somewhere in the Middle Ages. And the, and the, and the, the, the idea that the government gave the power to print money to people that are non-government does strike me as odd. I was about to say I completely agree with Bill. Everything was wonderful until the last line. Um, if you compare global GDP per capita now versus the Middle Ages, we've done pretty well. So something good happened since the Middle Ages, and maybe having governments have elastic currency was part of that. Uh, we can say awesome. that when, when it gets around to debating the nature of uh, money, it shows that economic ideas have cycles, just like financial and economic events do. Or as Desmond says, in economics is like going to the dog track. If you stay in one place, the dogs will come around again. Uh, I have a question back here. Uh, I'm Danny Bachman from Deloitte. Um, so we're, the economy is finally, finally sort of kind of getting to full employment, and I go to a panel in which everyone is worried about monetary policy being too expansionary. No, and I'm wondering, no not everyone. Not everyone, thank you. So I'm wondering if what that suggests is that, is that monetary policy can't get us to full employment, and if, if, if that's the driving force that's creating these bubbles, and maybe we need to go back to, to the sec Larry Summers secular stagnation and think about what it could be that prevents the economy from reaching full employment um, uh, under normal circumstances. Okay, thank you. How about secular stagnation and all this? Uh, can I just, so Summers and I were together on, at an event in Hong Kong last week, and um, Obviously, people were much more there to hear Larry than to hear me. But um, in his remarks, Larry said something which he had said earlier at one of our productivity conferences, um, which is this idea that one possible implication of his secular stagnation view that fits with current events, and which frankly is more supportive of uh, Bill and Desmond's kind of view, is that we have been unable to sustain a higher rate of growth in the U.S., he would say, for 30 years without having financial froth come up. And that this, this is a concern. Now, again, this links back to my response to the lady's previous comment question, which is that says that um, the real limits on growth, when you start running up against those, maybe the overheating you see is financial rather than inflation in the, in the classic sense. Um, and this relates, again, to what, what Vince was saying a minute ago. Um, so it's, it's a very, so again, just to emphasize, we're getting very into issues of monetary policy and so on, but the real economy, I just want to emphasize, I think you're right to raise this, the real economy slowdown, the slowdown in productivity growth, that's the real stuff. And again, it may be deus ex machina, it'll just change and we're fine. But as Vince mentioned, one of the ways we got into monetary trouble in the 70s was because the monetary policy and the political world was unwilling to uh, adapt to a lower po po productivity growth rate. And going back to where Bill started this morning, uh, pro demographics obviously play a role in that. And there's only so much policy can do about that. Yeah, Anybody I, else I, on secular stagnation? Yeah, or? I, I, I think uh, you, has, uh, you, you can tell the story that the Federal Reserve actually was a serial bubble blower over the last 30 years, tech, housing, uh, and so on. Um, I think the issue is about levels versus rates of growth. The Federal Reserve has to take as given the path for aggregate supply. It's about demographics. It's about productivity. It's about governmental policies generally, but not central bank policy. And right now we're at a junction where Janet Yellen was right. She uh, provided policy accommodation to fill in aggregate demand to aggregate supply, but we're at the point now where plausibly resource use is, uh, is complete and the Federal Reserve should take opportunities to continue to renormalize monetary policy. 
if, if it does so, inflation probably will tick higher, but we'll also say in a couple years that was pretty successful. Desmond? I would just question a little bit of what Vince said, is I would have thought that, you know, just judging by the post-2008 experience, we can safely say that gross mistakes made by the Federal Reserve put us on a lower growth path. You know, that if we didn't have the housing and credit market bubble and we didn't have all of the fallout, we would have been growing at a very much faster rate uh, than we did before. You know, and my fear is uh, that the Fed is not only a serial bubble blower, uh, but it was joined by the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, all the rest, and what they've done in the process, uh, you know, but perhaps not, I wouldn't totally blame them because the governments didn't leave them much option, but what they've done in the process is they're likely to have put us on a very much lower growth path going forward. I think on that note, which sums up the problems, unfortunately, we are out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us, and let's appreciate our panel. <laughs>